is in hell at the annual dinner of the Tempters Training College for Young Devils. The principal, Dr. Slovgob, has just proposed the health of the guest. Screwtape, a very experienced devil, who is the guest of honor, rises to reply. Mr. Principal, your eminence, your disgraces, my thorns, shadies, and gentle devils. It is customary on these occasions for the speaker to address himself chiefly to those among you who have just graduated and who will very soon be posted to official temptorships on Earth. It is a custom I willingly obey. I well remember with what trepidation I awaited my own appointment. I hope and believe that each one of you has the same unease tonight. Your career is before you. Hell expects and demands that it should be, as mine was, one of unbroken success. If it is not, well, you know what awaits you. I have no wish to reduce the wholesome and realistic element of terror, the unremitting anxiety which must act as the lash and spur you to your endeavors. How often you will envy the humans their faculty of sleep. Yet, at the same time, I would wish to put before you a moderately encouraging view of the strategical situation as a whole. Your dreaded principal has included in a speech full of points something like an apology for the banquet which he has set before us. Well, gentle devils, no one blames him. But it would be vain to deny that the human souls on which we, and whose anguish we have been feasting tonight, were of pretty poor quality. Not all the most skillful cookery of our tormentors could make them better than insipid. Oh, to get one's teeth into a farinata, a Henry VIII or even a Hitler, there was a real crackling there, something to crunch, a rage, an egotism, a cruelty, only just less robust than our own. It put up a delicious resistance to being devoured, it warmed your inwards when you got it down. Instead of this, what have we had tonight? There was a municipal authority with graft sauce. But personally, I could not detect in him the flavor of a really passionate and brutal avarice such as delighted one in the great tycoons of the last century. Was he not unmistakably a little man? A creature of the petty rake-off pocketed with petty joke in private and denied with the stainless platitudes in his public utterances. A grubby little non-entity who had drifted into corruption only just realizing that it was corrupt. And chiefly because everyone else did it. Oh, and then there was the lukewarm casserole of adulterers. Could you find in it any trace of a fully inflamed, defiant, rebellious, insatiable lust? Well, I certainly couldn't. They all tasted to me like undersexed morons who had blundered or trickled into the wrong beds in automatic response to sexy advertisements or, or to make themselves feel modern and emancipated or to reassure themselves about their virility or their normalcy or even because they had nothing else to do. Uh, frankly, to me, who have tasted Messalina and Casanova, they were uh, absolutely nauseating. The trade unionist stuffed with sedition was perhaps a shade better. He had done some real harm. He had, not quite knowingly of course, worked for the bloodshed, famine, and the extinction of liberty. Yes, in a way. But what a way he thought of those ultimate objectives so little. Towing the party line, self-importance, and above all mere routine were what really dominated his life. But now comes the point. Gastronomically, this is all deplorable. But I hope none of us puts gastronomy first. Is it not, in another and far more serious way, full of hope and promise? Consider, first, the mere quantity. The quality may be wretched. I cannot deny that. But we have never had souls of a sort in more abundance. And then the triumph, we are tempted to say that such souls, or such residual puddles of what was once a soul, are hardly worth damning, yes, yes. But the enemy, for whatever inscrutable perverse reason, thought them worth trying to save. 
Believe me, he did. You youngsters who have not yet been on active service have no idea with what labor, with what delicate skill, each one of these miserable creatures was finally captured. The difficulty lay in their very smallness and flabbiness. Here were vermin so muddled in mind, so passively responsive to environment, that it was very hard to raise them to that level of clarity and deliberateness in which moral sin even becomes possible. To raise them just enough, but not that fatal millimeter of too much. For then, of course, all would be possibly lost. They might have been. They might have actually repented. On the other hand, if they had been raised too little, they would be very possibly qualified for limbo, as creatures suitable neither for heaven nor hell, things that, having failed to make the grade, are allowed to sink into a more or less contented subhumanity forever. In each individual choice of what the enemy would call the wrong turning, such creatures are at first hardly, if at all, in a state of full spiritual responsibility. They do not understand either the source nor the real character of the prohibitions they are breaking. Their consciousness hardly exists apart from the social atmosphere that seems to surround them. And, of course, we have contrived that their very language should be all smudge and blur. That would be a bribe in someone else's profession is a, is a tip, or perhaps a present in there. The job of their tempters was first, of course, to harden these choices of the hellward roads into a habit by steady repetition. But then, and this was all important, to turn the habit into a principle, a principle the creature is prepared to defend after all. All will go well. Conformity to the social environment, at first merely indistinctive or even mechanical. How should a jelly not conform, after all? Now becomes an unacknowledged creed or ideal of togetherness, or being like folks. Mere ignorance of the law they break now turns into a vague theory about it. Remember, they had no no history. The history expressed by calling it conventional, or Puritan, or bourgeois morality. Thus gradually there comes to exist at the center of the creature a hard, tight, settled core of revolution to go on being what it is and even to resist moods that might tend to alter it. It is a very small core, not at all reflective, they are too ignorant after all, nor defiant, their emotional and imaginative poverty excludes that. Almost in its own way, prim and demure, like a, like a pebble or a very young cancer. But it will serve our turn. Here at last is a real and deliberate, though not fully articulate, rejection of what the enemy calls great. These then are two welcome phenomena. First, the abundance of our captures. However tasteless or fair, we are in no danger of famine. And secondly, the triumph. The skill of our tempters has never stood higher. But the third moral, which I have not yet drawn, is the most important of all. The sort of souls on whose despair and ruin we have, well, I won't say feasted, but at any rate subsisted, tonight are increasing in numbers and will continue to increase. Our advices from the lower command assure us that this is so. Our directors warn us to orient all our tactics in view of this particular situation. The great sinners, those in whom vivid and genial passions have been pushed beyond the bounds, and in whom an immense concentration of will has been devoted to objects which the enemy abhors, will not disappear, but they will grow rarer. Our catches will be ever more numerous, but they will consist increasingly of trash. Trash which we should have once thrown to Cerebus and the Hellhounds as unfit for diabolical consumption. And there are two things I want you to understand about this. First, that however depressing it may seem, it is really a change for the better. And secondly, I would draw your attention to the means by which it has been brought about. It is a charge for the better. The great and toothsome sinners are made out of the very same material as those horrible phenomena, Ugh, the great saints. The virtual disappearance of such material may need insipid meals for us. 
but is it not utter frustration and famine for the enemy? He did not create the humans. He did not become one of them and die among them by torture in order to produce candidates for limbo or failed humans. He wanted to make saints, gods, things like unto himself. Is the dullness of your present fare not a very small price to pay for the delicious knowledge that his whole great experiment is petering out? But not only that, as the great sinners grow fewer, and the majority lose all individuality, the great sinners become far more effective agents for us. Every dictator, or even demagogue, almost every film star or crooner, it seems, can now draw tens of thousands of the human sheep with him. They give themselves, what there is of them, to him, in him, to us. There may come a time when we shall have no need to bother about individual temptation at all, except for the few. Catch the bellwether, and his whole flock comes after him. But do you realize how we have succeeded in reducing so many of the human race to the level of ciphers? This has not come about by accident. It has been our answer, and a magnificent answer it is, to one of the most serious challenges we ever had to face. Let me recall to your minds what the human situation was in the latter half of the 19th century the period at which I ceased to be a practicing tempter and was rewarded with an administrative post. The great movement towards liberty and equality among men had by then borne solid fruits and grown mature. Slavery had been abolished. The American War of Independence had been won. The French Revolution had succeeded. Religious toleration was almost everywhere on the increase. In that moment, in that movement, there had been originally many elephants which were in our favor. Much atheism, much anti-clericalism, much envy and thirst for revenge, even some rather absurd attempts to revive paganism were mixed in with it. It was not easy to determine what our own attitude or strategy should be. On the one hand, it was a bitter blow to us. It still is, of course, that any sort of men who had been hungry should be fed, or any who had long worn chains should have been struck off. But, on the other hand, there was in the movement so much rejection of faith, so much materialism, secularism, and hatred, that we felt we were bound to encourage it. But by the latter part of the century, the situation was much simpler, and also much more ominous. In the English sector, where I saw most of my front service, a horrible thing had happened. The enemy, with his usual sleight of hand, had largely appropriated this progressive or liberalizing movement and perverted it to his own ends. Very little of its old anti-Christianity remained. The dangerous phenomenon called Christian Socialism was rampant. Factory owners of the good old type who grew rich on sweated labor, instead of being assassinated by the work people, we could have used that, were being frowned upon by their own class. The rich were increasingly giving up their powers, not in the face of revolution and compulsion, but in obedience to their own consciences. As for the poor who benefited by this, they were behaving in a most disappointing fashion. Instead of using their new liberties, as we reasonably hoped and expected, for massacre, for rape, and for looting, or even for perpetual intoxication, they were, hmm, perversely engaged in becoming cleaner, more orderly, more thrifty better educated, and even more virtuous. Blah. Believe me, gentle devils, the threat of something really like a healthy state of society seemed then perfectly serious. Thanks to our father below, the threat was averted. Our counterattack was on two levels. On the deepest level, our leaders contrived to call into full life an element which had been implicit in the movement from its earliest days. Hidden in the heart of this striving for liberty, there was also a deep hatred of personal freedom. That invaluable man Rousseau first revealed it. In his perfect democracy, you remember, only the state religion was permitted, slavery is restored, and the individual is told that he has really willed, though he didn't know of it, whatever the government tells him to do. From that starting point, via Hegel, another indispensable propagandist for our side, 
we easily contrived both the Nazi and the communist state. Even in England we were pretty successful. I heard the other day in that country a man could not without a permit cut down his own tree with his own axe, make it into planks with his own saw, and use the planks to build a tool shed in his own garden. <laughs> Such was our counterattack on one. You who are mere beginners, of course, will not be entrusted with work of that kind. You will be attached to tempters to private persons. Against them, or through them, our counterattack takes a different form. Democracy is the word with which you must lead them about by the nose. A good work which our philolo philolo philological experts have already done in the corruption of human language makes it unnecessary to warn you that they should ever be allowed to give this word a clear and definable meaning. Because they won't. It will never occur to them that democracy is properly the name of a political system, even a system of voting and that this has only the most remote and tenuous connection with what you are trying to sell them. Nor, of course, must they ever be allowed to raise Aristotle's question whether democratic behavior means the behavior that democracies like, or the behavior that will preserve a democracy. For if they did, they could hardly fail to occur in their minds that these need not be the same. You are to use the word purely as an incantation, if you like, purely for its selling power. It is a name they venerate, and of course it is connected with the political ideal that men should be equally treated. You then make a stealthy transition in their minds from this political idea of being equally treated to a factual belief that all men are equal, especially the man you are working on. As a result, you can use the word democracy to sanction in his thoughts the most degrading and also the least enjoyable of all human feelings. You can get him on to practice not only without shame, but with a positive glow of self-approval, conduct, which if undefended by the magic word, would be universally derided. The feeling, I mean of course, that which prompts a man to say, I'm as good as you. You. The first and most obvious advantage is that you thus induce him to enthrone at the center of his life a good, solid, resounding lie. Now I don't merely mean that his statement is false in fact, that he is no more equal to everyone he meets in kindness, and honesty, and good sense than in height or waist measure. <laughs> That he doesn't yet even believe himself. No man who says, I'm as good as you, truly believes it. He would not say it if he did. The St. Barnard never says it to the toy dog, nor the scholar to the dunce, nor to the employable to the bum, nor the pretty woman to the plain. The claim to equality, outside the strictly political field, is made only by those who feel themselves to be in some way, some way, inferior. What it expresses is precisely the itching, smarting, writhing awareness of an inferiority which the patient refuses to accept, and therefore resents. Hmm. Yes, and therefore resents every kind of superiority in others. He denigrates it, wishes its annihilation. Presently, he suspects every mere difference of being a claim to superiority. No one must be different than himself. Not in voice, or clothes, or manners, or recreations, or choice of food. Here is someone who speaks English rather more clearly and euphoniously than I. It must be a vile, upstage, latida affectation. Here's a fellow who says he doesn't like hot dogs. Thinks himself too good for them, no doubt. Aha, here's a man who hasn't turned on the jukebox. He's one of those damn highbrows, and is doing it to show off. If they were all honest to heaven like Joes, they'd be like me. They've no business to be different. It's undemocratic. Now, this useful phenomenon is in itself by no means new. Under the name of envy, it has been known to the humans for thousands of years. But hitherto, they've always regarded it as the most odious and also the most comical of vices. 
Those who were aware of feeling it felt it was shame. Those who were not gave it no quarter in others. The delightful novelty of the present situation is that you can sanction it, make it respectable and even laudable, by the incantatory use of the word democratic. Under the influence of this incantation, those who are in any or every way inferior can labor more wholeheartedly and successfully than ever before to pull down everyone else to their own level. But that is not all. Under the same influence, those who come, or those could come, nearer to the full humanity actually draw back from it for fear of being undemocratic. I am credibly informed that young humans now sometimes suppress an incipient taste for classical music or good literature because it might prevent their being like folks. That people who would really wish to be and are offered the grace which would enable them to be honest, chaste, or temperate, refuse it. To accept might make them different, might offend against the way of life, take them out of togetherness, impair their integration with the group. They might, <laughs> horror of horrors, become individuals. All is summed up in the prayer which a young female human is said to have uttered recently. Oh God, make me a normal 20th century girl. Now, thanks to our laborers and laborers, this will mean increasingly make me a minx, a moron, and a parasite. Meanwhile, as a delightful byproduct, the few, and becoming fewer every day, who will not be made normal and regular and like folks and integrated increasingly, tend to become, in reality, the prigs and cranks which the rabble would in any case have believed them to be. For suspicion often creates what it suspects. Since whatever I do, the neighbors are going to think me a witch or a communist agent, I might as well be hanged for sheep as a lamb and become one in reality. Hmm. As a result, we now have an intelligentsia which, though very small, is very useful to the cause of hell. But that is a mere byproduct. What I want to fix your attention on is the vast overall movement towards the discrediting and finally the elimination of every kind of human excellence, moral, cultural, social, or intellectual. And is it not pretty to notice how democracy, in the incantatory sense I described, is now doing for us the work that was once done by the most ancient dictatorships? And by the same methods? You remember how one of the Greek dictators, they called them tyrants then, sent an envoy to another dictator to ask his advice about the principles of government. The second dictator led the envoy into a field of grain where he nicked off with his cane the top of every stalk that rose an inch or so above the general level. The moral was quite plain. Allow no preeminence among your subjects. Let no man live who is wiser or better or more famous or even handsomer than the mass. Cut them all down to a level. All slaves, all ciphers, all nobodies, all equals. No one, and now democracy can do the same work without any tyranny other than her own. No one need now go through the field with a cane. The little starks will now of themselves bite the tops off the big ones. The big ones are beginning to bite off their own in a desire to be like stalks. <laughs> I have said that to secure the damnation of these little souls, these creatures that have been all ceasing to be individual, is a laborious and tricky work. But if proper pains and skills are expended, you can fairly be confident of the result. The great sinners seem, seem easier to catch, but then they are incalculable. After you've played them for seventy years, the enemy may snatch them from your claws in the 71st. They are capable, you see, of real repentance. They are conscious of real guilt. They, they are, if things take the wrong turn, as ready to defy the social pressures around them for the enemy's sake 
as they were to defy them for hours. It is in some ways more troubling to track and swat an evasive wasp than to shoot at close range a wild elephant. But the wild elephant is more troublesome, should you miss. My own personal experience, as I have said, was mainly on the English sector, and I still get some more news from it, and do so more than any other. It may be that what I am now going to say will not fully apply to the sectors in which some of you may be operating, but you can make the necessary adjustments when you get there. Some application will almost certainly have. If it has too little, you must labor to make the country you're dealing with more like what the England portion of the sectors already is. In that promising land, the spirit is I am as good as you has already become something more than a general social influence. It begins to work itself into their educational system. How far its operations there have gone at the present moment, I should not like to say with certainty. Nor does it matter. Once you have grasped the tendency, you can easily predict its future developments, especially as we ourselves will play our part in the developing. The basic principle of the new education is to be that dunces and idlers must not be made to feel inferior to intelligent and industrious pupils. That would be undemocratic. These differences between the pupils, for they are obviously and nakedly individual differences, must be disguised. This can be done on various levels. At universities, examinations must be framed just so that nearly all the students get good marks. Entrance examinations must be framed so that all, or nearly all, citizens can go to universities, whether they have any power or wish to profit by higher education or not. At schools, the children who are too stupid or lazy to learn languages and mathematics and elementary science can be set to doing things that children used to do in their spare time. Let them, for example, make mud pies and call it modern art or modeling. But all the time there must be no faintest hint that they are inferior to the children who are at work. Whatever nonsense they are engaged in must have, I, I believe the English already have the phrase, <laughs> parity of esteem. <laughs> An even more drastic scheme is not even impossible. Children who are fit to proceed to higher class may be artificially kept back, because the others would get trauma. Beelzebub, what a useful word, by being left behind. The bright pupil thus remains democratically fettered to his own age group throughout his school career, and a boy who would be capable of attacking Schoenus or Dante sits listening to his kovals attempt to spell out a cat sat on a mat. <laughs> In a word, we may reasonably hope for the virtual abolition of education when I'm as good as you has fully had its way. Our incentives to learn and all penalties for not learning, will vanish. The few who might want to learn will be prevented. Uh, who are they to overtop their fellows, after all? And anyway, the teachers, or should I say, nurses, will be far too busy reassuring the dunces and patting them on the back to waste any time on real teaching. We shall no longer have to plan and toil to spread imperturbable conceit and incurable ignorance among men. The little vermin themselves will do it for us. Now, of course, this would not follow unless all education became state education. But it will. That is part of the same movement. Penal taxes, designed for that purpose, are liquidating the middle class, the class who were prepared to save and spend and make sacrifices in order to have their children privately educated. The removal of this class besides linking up with the abolition of education, is fortunately an inevitable effect of the spirit that says, I'm as good as you. This was, after all, the social group which gave to the humans the overwhelming majority of their scientists, physicians, philosophers, theologians, poets, artists, composers, architects, jurists, 
and administrators. If ever there was a bunch of tall stocks that needed their tops locked off, it was surely they. As an English politician remarked not long ago, a democracy does not want great men. It would be idle to ask of such a creature whether by want it meant need or like. But you had better be clear, for here Aristotle's question comes up again. We in hell would welcome the disappearance of democracy in the strictest sense of that word, the political arrangement so-called. Like all forms of government, it often works to our advantage, but on the whole, less often than other forms. And what you must realize is that democracy, in the diabolical sense, I'm as good as you, being like folks, togetherness and so forth, is the finest instrument we could possibly have had for extirpating political democracy on the face of the earth. For democracy, or the democratic spirit in the diabolical sense, leads a nation without great men. A nation mainly of subliterates, full of the cocksuredness which flattery breeds on ignorance, and quick to snarl or whimper at the first hint of criticism. And that is what Hill wishes every democratic people to be. But when such a nation meets in conflict with a nation where children have been made to work at school, where talent is placed in high places, and where the ignorant mass are allowed to no say at all in public affairs, only one result is possible. The democracies were surprised lately when they found that Russia had gotten ahead of them in science. What a delicious specimen of human blindness. Huh. If the whole tendency of their society is opposed to every sort of excellence, why did they expect their scientists to excel? It is our function, therefore, to encourage the behavior, the manners, the whole attitude of mind which democracies naturally like and enjoy, because these are the very things which, if unchecked, will destroy the democracy itself. You would almost wonder that even humans don't see it themselves. Even if they don't read Aristotle, <laughs> that would, of course, be undemocratic. <laughs> you would have thought the French Revolution would have taught them that the behavior aristocrats naturally like is not the behavior that preserves aristocracy. They might then have applied the same principle to all forms of government. But I would not end on that note. I would not. Oh, hell forbid. Encourage in your own minds that delusion which you must carefully foster in the minds of your human victims. I mean, the delusion that the fate of nations is, in itself, more important than that of individual souls. The overthrow of free peoples and the multiplication of slave states are for us a means, uh, besides, of course, being very fun. <laughs> but the real end is the destruction of individuals, you see. For only individuals can be saved or damned and become sons of the enemy or food for us. The ultimate value for us of any revolution or war or famine lies in the individual anguish and treachery, the hatred, the rage and despair which it may produce. I'm as good as you is a useful means for the destruction of the democratic societies, but it has a far deeper value as an end in itself, as a state of mind which, necessarily excluding humility and charity and contentment, and all the pleasures of gratitude or admiration turns a human being away from almost every road that might eventually lead him to heaven. But, <clears throat> now for the president's part of my duty, it falls my lot to propose on behalf of the guests of the health of Principal Slubgob and the Tempter's Training College. Fill your glasses. What is this I see? Ah, what is this delicious bouquet I inhale? Can it be? Mr. Principal, I unsay all my harsh words about the dinner. I see and smell that even under wartime conditions, the college cellar still has a few dozen of sound old vintage heresy. <laughs> well, well, well. This is like the old times. Hold it beneath your nostrils for a moment, gentle devils. Hold it up to the light. 
Look at those fiery streaks that writhe and tangle in its dark heart. As if they were contending. And so they are. You know how this wine is blended? Different types of Pharisee have been harvested, trodden, and fermented together to produce its subtle flavor. Types that were most antagonistic to one another on Earth. Some were all rules and relics and rosaries. Others were all drab clothes, long faces, and petty traditional abstinences from wine or cards at the theater. Both had their common in their self-righteousness and the almost infinite distance between their actual outlook and anything the enemy really is or commands. The wickedness of other religions was the really live doctrine in the religion of each. Slander was its gospel, and denigration its litany. How oh, they hated each other, up there where the sun shone. How much more they hate each other now that they are forever conjoined but not reconciled. Their astonishment, their resentment at the combination, the festering of their eternally impendent spite, passing into our spiritual digestion, will work like fire. Dark fire. All said and done, my friends, it will be an ill day for us if what most humans mean by religion ever vanishes from the earth. It can still send us the truly delicious sins. The fine flower of unholiness can only grow in the close neighborhood of the holy. Nowhere do we tempt so successfully as on the very steps of the altar. Your eminence, your disgraces, my thorn shadies and gentle devils, I give you the toast of Principal Slubgob and the College. <laughs>